Hello and welcome to Sunday Catch Up. We're so happy that we're still able to provide this for you and we hope that you are staying safe and well at this time. In this Sunday Catch Up, uh, Robin is going to be continuing our series looking at pictures of the cross and he's going to be speaking from Luke chapter 20 verses 9 to 19. I hope you find it really helpful and fruitful and I look forward to seeing you very soon. Let's just pray, shall we, and commit our time in God's word to God. Let's pray. Father God, we know that when you've given us the Bible, it's not just another book, it's a special way that we can know you. And so as we have it read to us and then taught to us, I do pray that you would speak, Lord, and we would listen. Just as the prophet Samuel said when he heard your voice, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. That is our prayer now, that you would give us ears to hear what you want to say to us, to encourage us, to challenge us, to guide us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's reading from God's Holy Word is taken from Luke 20. Verses 19, no, 9 to 19, and can be found in the Church Bibles on page 1054. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants, so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. The guy arrived home from work shortly after his wife and uh, just said, well, so what sort of day have you had? She said, well, do you want the good news? or the bad news. He said, well, I've had an absolutely rotten day. Please just give me the good news. She paused a moment. The airbags in the car work really well. (laughs) Good news can be overtaken by the bad. And this reading which we've just had is from the gospel, and the gospel means good news, and the bulk of what we've heard from it is bad news. And the reason that it seemed like most of this was bad news is because it was bad news. But there were two glimmers of light in it. One of them was to relate to the future glory of Jesus 
and there were a couple of lines about that. There was a bit about ourselves, and that just comes in one word. So if you're listening very carefully to that Bible reading, you can let your subconscious work on that for the next 10 minutes and see if you can work out what that one word was. But we've got to begin with the bad news. And you might be thinking, well, hang on, isn't it sort of meant to be Palm Sunday? Well, fair enough, we've sung Hosanna, which we haven't got to by this point in the nine o'clock service. And we've seen the donkey, and there was no sight of that in the nine o'clock service. Uh, but th this Bible reading is hardly Palm Sunday stuff. Well, it is. Because Jesus is now speaking in that period between Palm Sunday, although it hadn't been given that title by then, and Good Friday. And likewise, that hadn't acquired that title by then either. But he is now talking to the, the crowds who, without them realising it, are in and part of the most significant week in our history. We can feel from time to time, and fairly enough to some degree, that sort of we live in significant times. And that's, that is true. But nothing like what was happening at that point a couple of thousand years back. And Jesus is now beginning to draw all the threads, all the strands together. And that story he told was going to point out how the Son of God was going to be rejected. And that these days of which they were a part of were absolutely central. They were to provide an explanation and a commentary on the centuries past and point out some of the significance of events yet to come. And so he tells a story. A man planted a vineyard. And within a couple of minutes or so in his story, he is actually giving a summary of the history of Israel from God's perspective. A vineyard planted. A story about how, really, God had provided something within which his intention was that people should be able to flourish with cooperation with him. And that that was very much a sign and a symbol that they kept with them because it even appeared on, on some of their coinage, the vine, their, their picture of themselves as being God's vineyard. And yet the story goes on to show that when God wanted some return on his investment, he wasn't getting the response. People were going their own ways. He sent the prophets, which occasionally made a temporary difference, but on the whole, they were just on this downward trajectory. He was getting no return on his investment. And then as Jesus continues to tell the story of the vineyard and the servants being sent to try and get some response, then he comes to that point and saying, what shall I do? I'll send my son. Perhaps they'll respect him. But they say, let's kill him. And the inheritance will be ours. And the crowd will get uncomfortable at this point for all sorts of reasons. For those who had a deeper sense of what the story was about, will be saying, well, we know about the prophets, but where does a son come into this? Others will be thinking, hang on, this story just does not make sense. In what way could the tenants believe 
that by killing the heir, they themselves would get the inheritance. That is just, a, you know, totally illogical. But we know only too well that if the truth is held at a distance, ultimately, people will believe the most ridiculous of things. If the truth is pushed further and further away, folk will believe anything. The latest version of the dictionary doesn't have the word gullible in it. And if you believe that, If the truth is pushed further and further away, people will believe anything. And if goodness and kindness are pushed further and further away, people will get to the position of thinking that they can get away with anything and get away with murder. So Jesus completed the story by saying, so they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. To them is an unsettling part of the story, but for him he's picturing and going through what he knows he'll be experiencing in the next two to three days. Over these last few weeks we've been having what we call pictures of the cross and looking at some themes drawn from the Old Testament one last week from, from Mark's Gospel. Different things which are featuring and describing what is going on at the cross. And that which we have today is this picture of rejection. A rejection not only of what God has provided, but a rejection of God himself in his Son. When John wrote his version of the gospel, he actually put this in the opening chapter. Halfway through John chapter 1. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him, and he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Written into the story from the start not recognized, not received, neither welcomed nor wanted. You might at some time have put in an application for a job and not been chosen. That says nothing compared to the experience you had in the playground. Picking teams. The captain just needs five for his side. That one needs five for theirs. And the picking starts, and you're not chosen. But there's something worse than not being chosen. It's not being wanted. And there's something worse than not being wanted. It's being neither welcomed nor wanted. And Jesus was to find at every level you don't fit. And that will be one of the elements weighing on him as he can see the cross getting sharper and sharper before him. Rejected at every conceivable level. But I said that there was a couple of glimmers, the, the first glimmer of hope, that is he now throws in a hint of something that is going to happen in the future. The psalm which is quoted more than any other in the, in the New Testament is Psalm 118. Various bits of that are chosen at different points. But Jesus here chooses to pick on that couple of lines. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. You will have seen some of the developments taking place locally, the Netherton Grange one and the Parish Brook one. And for all that building work, either things are brought in already fully made, be it the bricks, 
or for the parish brook one, it's all coming in flat packs or something. Um, or things are made on site according to the plans already drawn up. So a picture of the digger which comes across a boulder which is so bulky they're just wondering what to do with it. Does the site foreman say, now that is just what we need? We'll change the plans. We'll sort out planning permission later. But that lovely bit of brickwork that the architect has put on those first buildings, we'll, um, we'll yank all that out and we'll slam the boulder in there. Let that be the first thing people see as they come to see the development. Or rather, does the foreman say, get shut of it. It's neither wanted nor welcome, it's neither use nor ornament. And Jesus is saying, the world is working its purposes out in one way, but ultimately, People will see that that which the world rejected is not only made use of, but is actually both pivotal and glorious. He's still yet in the days leading to Good Friday. And the world and he do not fit. You don't challenge the powers that be. You don't challenge what's in the hearts of men and women. And in Gethsemane, as he was arrested, he said, this is your hour when darkness reigns. And the cross, amongst so many other things, is shouting out the message you don't fit. Neither wanted nor welcomed. The days that were to follow would say who was right and who was wrong. And the scriptures would later on go on to describe that how that ultimately every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Pivotal and glorious. But for Jesus, Good Friday is coming. Rejection is still to come in his experience. But there was another glimmer. And did anybody work out what the one word was that referred to us? It's another word. Other. He will come and give the vineyard to others. John, again. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God inheritors of the blessings planned from the beginning of time and now seen not as tenants even but as children grace upon grace and Paul later on to say be imitators of God follow God's example therefore as dearly loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering. Now you may have wondered, probably the one thing which has been bugging you ever since I sort of came into church this morning is, why is he the only guy here wearing a jacket? <laughs> is he expecting the donkey to be led down here so he can take it off and lay it down in front? No, it's, it's because of, um, well, 
a guy had gone to have his, um, he had gone to a suit made to measure. And when he went to pick it up, he put it on, and he said to the tailor, he said, There's a, this sleeve, you've cut it a bit short. No problem, said the tailor. All you need to do, you pull it down slightly, and with a couple of fingers, you just hold it. But he said, yes, but the other sleeve is too long. <laughs> no problem. By holding that shoulder forward and stretching your arm, it's just right. But he then pointed out that there was a seam that was slightly less than straight on his trousers. All you do, said the tailor, once you put your trousers on, just twist them slightly, and by squeezing your thighs together, <laughs> absolutely right. And being gullible, he then walked out, and he's hobbling down the street, thighs together, knees together, like this. And a couple of guys on the other side of the street one says, just look at that poor fella. I wonder how long he's had to sort of put up with that. It must be painful. And his friend says, but what a wonderful tailor he must have to make a suit to fit him so well. <laughs> There might be times when you adjust the body to fit the clothing, but the bulk of the time, the clothing is meant to be cut to suit the body. You don't change the body to fit the suit. And yet, the pattern having been given in our Lord, to what extent do we still want to adjust his ways to suit what we are rather than amend our ways to suit him. Which way round is the fitting meant to go? And it is possible even once we become Christians and we genuinely do think that we are sort of going along on the right way it is still possible from time to time that we seek to adjust what we see from him to fit what we are by nature and even by second nature. We may hear the words of the gospel of Jesus says, be this and do that. The actions and the attitudes and we seek to modify them to suit us, rather than ensure that we are seeking to fit him. And in this period, leaving up to Easter, we don't need to put ourselves into the position of those who, um, like uh, Judas, betrayed Jesus, nor of those in the religious leadership who sought to reject and destroy Jesus. But it might be appropriate from time to time to consider, am I really fitting as well as I ought to what I have been shown? It was for the greater things and the lesser things that Jesus was prepared to be rejected. Good Friday is yet to come as far as the church calendar is concerned. But as far as reality is concerned, Easter has happened. Jesus has been raised. Jesus is risen. Therefore, we can have the confidence to believe that we can be changed to fit him rather than seek to change him to fit us. Easter has happened. Hosanna. Let's pray.
Lord, we thank you for your willingness to experience that which we can never fully understand, but to know that your love is so complete. We grieve at the degree to which you were rejected then, and that to which we still see your ways being rejected today. Help us, who have been brought to faith, to live as you would wish, to follow, to imitate, and to reveal all that you mean to us. We ask it for your glory. Amen. Lift up.